Blaming others can be thrilling, but it's often self-reflection that truly challenge our thoughts and enrich our souls. When I first started this channel, I didn't want this to be just another echo chamber for like-minded people. I want to reach into a, a wider audience and for me to not seen as a propagandist from China and always sugarcoat everything from China and demonize everything outside of China. It's very important that from time to time that I put up videos that I look at China and see something that I am dissatisfied and perhaps what I want to see how China might change in the future. So today we're going to change uh, the topic a little bit and talk about China more internally. And I'm going to ask many very, very sharp questions and see if uh, we can come to a common understanding. For example, will China become a democracy in the future? And I bought one very special guest here today. His name is Wang Zan, and he's a very controversial figure in China. The, the best way to put it is this. I'm going to introduce him a little bit, and then I'm going to go to a broadcast section he had with uh, a host from Taiwan. And then I'm going to draw some of my own thoughts and opinion on the matter. I'm going to put timestamp in the video so you guys can jump to the question you're most interested in. And let's see if we can all learn something new here. So, Wang Zhan, who is he? From a Western perspective, I think the closest thing I would say he represents is someone like Kars Tuckerson. I, I think that is the right way to put it. Let me show you his uh, own history, okay? He worked 17 years from 1998 to uh, 2015 in CCTV, so basically the Chinese state media for 17 years, okay? And then he left and he worked for a private news uh, outlet for three years, basically run by him and uh, some of his employees. After that, he got banned and removed from China. According to himself, it was a dispute between him and the pharmaceutical company because he exposed some kind of cheating um, within uh, one of the company and the company decided to use political and, and, and different leverage to remove him from the Chinese media. So then he went on and lived in Japan for four years. Before he left China, he was very influential, okay? Here's some of his claim, and I think it's right. He was consistently ranked top influencer in China social media platform uh, in the political section. He has many videos with over a million views. So that's quite impressive for uh, a political subject because in, in reality, people are not that interested all, often in uh, geopolitical topics or internal political topics uh, for that matter. He also published article that had over 1 billion views. And I I'm not sure about that claim. I think people read article and then just leave and come back perhaps that count as double view or triple viewing to finish the entire article but still nevertheless that's very impressive with articles with a billion view and after that he he has a channel here on youtube i think he's one of the chinese uh, commentator with the highest amount of subscription uh 1.33 million right now so we're talking about let's say uh carl stockerson uh have 1.8 million, I think, as of today. So that's not too far. And he also have over 350 million view here on YouTube. So quite a influential, you know, person from China. The person who's interviewing him is from Taiwan. Lady Fan is how I could call her. Over 300 million, uh, 300,000 followers on YouTube. Uh, I watched some of his her her other videos. Um, I think there's a few videos that's in English. 
it's just I will say more Western centric than even some of the Americans today. Okay, <laughs> because I think there's a video I forgot what language is in talk about. There's a someone from America who came to her show and say that you know American university today is more woke than you know you you can imagine and <laughs> you can probably cannot get comfortable with what they are saying. So again. She's very Western centric and pro Taiwan independent, so she asks a lot of questions that is very sharp. I would say every other question is she asking when will China collapse? You know, we really want China to collapse and we can become independent. When would do do you think that? So the guy who、um, Wang Zhan, I would consider to be someone who is intellectual and pro democracy. From a Chinese perspective, but he's also very Chinese leaning. Okay, he he's very patriotic on many things.、Uh, I'm gonna well, his picture on Wikipedia is actually him standing behind, in front of a Ukrainian flag. He actually went to Ukraine to Odessa uh, right uh, after the war started and interview a lot of people. But he's actually pro or Russian leaning in reality. So a very complicated person. But the way he answer the question is very skillful. He knows China a lot better than I do. So by watching his video, I don't agree with all the things he said, but definitely I learned a lot. So I believe today my Western audience here can also learn a lot from him. Well, before going into the questions, I need to talk a little bit about COVID nineteen,、uh, because that's what the background of the interview come from. I was born in Wuhan. And I I arrived in Wuhan four days before the city went into lockdown. I also work in the medical business, so I know a lot of the details that is not in the mainstream media today. It was quite、oh, a horrible event. I I remember that when I figure out what actually went on, just right before. The city went into lockdown. Okay, I remember telling my father that this is something serious. He won't believe me, and at one point he insisted on to continue our、um, Chinese New Year celebration, not just within our family but in the factory as well. So what that means is that every year we hold this、uh, end year Chinese New Year celebration in the factory, which we invite. You know, not just the factory employees, but also their family to join, and we have this huge feast. I would say that every year there's over five thousand people to participate, and it's not five thousand people eating in the same place, but you know, it's over usually two to three days, and、uh, different group of you know employees bring their families and and. And celebrate, and we give out you know bonuses in cash to you know lift the spirit. And when I understood from my you know connect、uh, contacts in the hospital, I insist my father to stop the celebration、uh, for this year because this is very very sad. And I remember he said something in Chinese like, um, 以前饿都没饿死，这一点点病毒怕什么？ So、basically saying that you know we we've been starved to death before. Who cares about a little virus? And I I remember stopping him at, at our you know at the door, and then pulling him back and force him to watch this Hollywood movie called Contagious. And I tell him how serious the problem is. Okay, and he he's the movie he think a little bit. And that evening, he stopped it, all the parties. It, it was a huge expense. Imagine, you know, trying to feed five thousand people, and if you don't, you know, move on with the event, you know, all the food and all the preparation goes to waste. So he decided to stop the event, and then we divide the food, and then just have the employees take home、uh, for celebration in their own family. And just one day after that, the city went into lockdown. So I, I would say that I would like to see myself as someone who. Maybe save a few life by by doing that, but again, the the wave was ferocious. The virus was not very contagious, but very lethal. There was this、um, story from one of my relatives'、uh, senior dance class. 
uh, in which that I think there's 45 um, female dancers semi-retired in their 50 and 60 be 60 25 out of 45 died so yeah that was very crazy and from my knowledge there are within two months the actual casualty just in Wuhan I don't know other cities it's I would say roughly around 30,000 instead of the 3,000 claimed by the government but I don't have real data I just know that because I know the people in the cemetery, there's just extra death over that particular year. And yeah, um, what happened is later on, um, China went into many lockdowns, right? And when the Omicron variants hit, it is where things get ugly. At the beginning, things are very organized because the virus is not that contagious. It only appears in small places within China. But when Omicron came, um, the government started to lose control because it's just so contagious. One of the most contagious uh, virus, according to uh, research scientists. And, and it's no longer able to handle the situation and organize. And some of the area which went into lockdown suffer lack of resources, food, and other material and caring, basically. And people start to uh, went onto the street and protesting. And it become very stressful for a few weeks in which there is this famous white paper movement in China which people hold up this, you know, white piece of blind paper uh, because protests, as you guys know, in China was not, not that much encouraged. So uh, showing up a white paper is basically a sign of saying that we cannot do this anymore. We, we can't go through this lockdown anymore. There needs to be a change. And quickly after that, the government changed. Um, so knowing the background now, let's go into the first question, okay? So this first question the lady asked, also based up on the events that happened during COVID, she says this, this is such an ineffective system in which there's a lot of chaos. I acknowledge that. When do you think that it will finally lead to the collapse or the overthrow of the Chinese government? Because Chinese government has such a strong stranglehold on the people's life. Do you think it will happen anytime soon? And Wang Zhan, the guy who's being interviewed, he gave quite an intelligent answer here, okay? Let's see what he said here. Your observation is not entirely incorrect. Simplify the issue too much. I've always said that the solution of Chinese problem cannot be assessed within the framework of just three to five years. Because fundamentally speaking, a change like that are unlikely to occur in the next three to five years. Although that many Chinese people might not always agree with the decision made by the government, most Chinese people do not harbor the deep hatred towards the government neither. The protest that happens is a demonstration that people desire freedom and refuse to lock down. And government do listen to people and react accordingly. It is important to understand, and especially for the foreigners to understand, majority of the Chinese people just do not look forward to the collapse of the current Chinese ruling regime. And the ones that do think that way are extreme minority. Because there are a lot of false assumptions outside of China that majority of the people want to overthrow the government and there's just a lack of organization towards instrument. And this is simply wrong and it's not the case. In addition, China is a very big country. It is impossible for its political system to change overnight and not risk catastrophe consequence. It is incorrect to look at China saying that its political system didn't change much after such a hardship that happened, the relationship between people and the government actually readjust ever so slightly to a more comfortable position. And if we expand that process to, let's say, three to five decades, it can lead to significant changes. The Chinese government today with its advanced technology and monitoring system, is very effective in overseeing the population and preventing any anti-government organization or movement. 
So to expect any dramatic changes in China political landscape in the short term is almost impossible. Unless there's some kind of dramatic event, such as nuclear exchange, when it comes to China, change need to measure not in years, but in decades. So I would say I more or less agree to what he says here, because you have to really look at the size of China to appreciate um, how the Chinese government is running the country, okay? There are frustration, mistakes, and chaotic part of the COVID lockdown, but many of the uh, process was done very uh, efficiently, and people were not complaining that much. For example, there's more railway system in China compared to the total of the entire planet. And there's also more subway in China than all the subway combined in this world. And you don't see that many accidents, for example. And this is just to one way to look at it. There, If you look at always the negative news that's coming out from China, yes, there's many, many of them are true. But, you know, the Chinese people, we don't just always look at the negative things. We also look at the positive things. And we think that many of the things that are in China are actually very well run by the government. And we do not hold this grudge against the current ruling elites and when things does go wrong we complain we address and there are ways mechanisms uh, me mechanisms to push forward some kind of change without having to have this huge protest or overflow of the government or revolution so it's just not in the people today most of them are quite satisfied with what chinese government is doing and where we are heading Okay, the second question. The lady said, this feels like such a hopeless society where people feel frustrated that life cannot get better. And this is again how um, Mr. Wong answered the question. Okay? If a person is looking for a Western st style of political competition between political parties, freedom of speech at the level of Western country, first of all, I, I don't think there's that much freedom of speech in the West either. He's getting worse, not better. But here goes his answer, okay? It is almost hopeless. So he's saying that in China, if you want that kind of political system, you're not going to get it anytime soon, okay? But, but, if you're just looking for a better life, to build your wealth, to build your family, offsprings, China is actually a wonderful place to do that. One of the best places on the planet, even. So the logic of Chinese government is this. I'm not willing to share political power with the population in the Western style because I'm doing a good job. I deserve to be in power because I can give you a better life. Pretty much that's what the ruling government is trying to push forward in terms of, you know, explanation. And the conclusion is that the intellectuals in China, especially if you have this urge to voice your political op uh, opinions, China is probably not a good place for you. But if you just want to have a good life, China will do. And I also agree with him more or less here. And I want to say something. Um, it's not just in China, but I would say all over the planet. Most people are not that politically driven to begin with unless their governments start to feed them this kind of uh, anti-China or anti-Russia or anti-something narrative to get them hyped up. Most people just want a comfortable luxury life and live in security. That's what most people want. And Chinese are the same. Majority of the Chinese, if they don't always see things and read articles that are provocative, they don't feel it and they just get on with their life and spend the time and resources making their life better. It's not exactly necessary, I think, for most people to, to always be hyper-focused on political issues. And Mr. Wong went on to say this, okay? There's a certain confidence within the Chinese society today that China has achieved a path forward without having to follow a Western-style democracy. And the country is very well run and things are still improving. This is the philosophy behind it okay when you look at china you have to divide power into two parts okay there's the normal power which 
there's the right of ownership, uh, crime law enforcement, you know, people who do bad things get punished, the freedom to travel around, those things are well protected and enjoyed. However, if you're talking about political power, now that is heavily controlled and not allowed to be shared by the Chinese government. So again, there's a division. You have to separate things. Not everything has to get political all the time. And again, this gets very philosophical here, what he said, okay? Just because people's wealth and life gets better, it doesn't always lead to the demand for more political power and change. Chinese don't really believe that much in democracy. We never had it. Same thing can be said to Russia. Uh, they never get to vote to begin with. Well, they get to vote, but a lot of people say that it's not a real election. In China, we don't even get to vote. So if you go to Taiwan today and you say that, well, you're not allowed to vote and China is going to assign you some kind of ruler, maybe they will feel that they lost something. But Chinese in mainline China, they never have that to begin with. So, And their life is getting better. So there's not this kind of drive to say that, okay, we need something different like the Western style. And there are serious conversations in China about democracy because many of these people talk about it. Also, you live abroad, travel abroad. We really start to ask something more fundamental because for a time, we really thought this is like the global standard that in order to reach prosperity, we need to have democracy. But now to look back at it, we kind of question ourselves that, okay, Europe or United States is very prosperous, but is it really because of democracy? Or is it because, let's say, they industrialize early? Perhaps it's because of some kind of uh, imperialistic economic models? Or just driven by, you know, global policy that favors, you know, certain countries and favors less certain countries? Because, you know, in the global south, we don't really get to make the decision that governs the world today. And is it really democracy that brings a uh, good life? That, that, that is actually a good question. It, it makes you think a little. And anything, basically, ideological, political system, religion, from my point of view, they are not an end goal, okay? They are instruments. Um, they are tools. It's not really saying that one religion is better than the other or one political system is better than the other. It, at least when I'm getting edu my education here in the United States, the, the society made me think that way, but is it really the real thing? For example, for, for many countries, smaller countries in this world, they don't really think that ideologically. It doesn't really matter if a democracy invade their country or authoritarian or you know Christian or Muslim, they don't want to get invaded to begin with. You know, when they move on with their life, when they try to build their country, they want to have different options. It doesn't really matter where the options come from. And when they try to make that options, they don't want to get a gun point to their head. That's basically it. And this kind of ideology thing sometimes, from my perspective, is just too overused. And it might not actually explain many of the problems that we face today in the world. Many of the problems are more mathematical, let's say, scientific. One of the last question here. The lady keep pushing and say that, well, should we support some kind of uprising, a revolution maybe in China? Because from her point of view, she just cannot wait. She needs to change. And this is what... Uh, Mr. Wong said, I think this is one of the most interesting part, okay? When I left China, I knew that I might never be able to go back to China again. And China may not change much before I die. But I, I accept that fate. There's still many things I can do outside of China through peaceful means to make the country better. There's no point in approaching this through violent means. Because what do you expect? An all-out revolution? Is that what you support? What is the cost? For a person who support internal uprising in China while living abroad, you must carry this moral burden because do you understand what will be the cost for the people inside of China? Will you be willing to pay that cost with them as well? If you're not willing to put your life on the line 
don't easily go forward and motivate other people to do it. I think this is one of the biggest difference when I try to approach and talk about, for example, Ukrainian issues with the West. There's just this lack of balance, even after you know spending hundreds of thousands of hours debating who is to blame. But at the end, what do you try to achieve, right? Do do you do you want to really go all the way out? What will be the cost for you, your country, for Europe, or even for humanity? Is this something really that we cannot settle down peacefully and let it just hang out a little bit longer and perhaps we can find a joint solution in the future? Do you really have to push your point with all means necessary at this very moment? What would be the cost? Are you really ready to pay for that cost? That is quite an interesting point. And for us Chinese, we think about the world, how we run our country in, I say, some kind of harmony, not in this violent way of something's wrong, I need to go all the way out to change it. It's just not the Chinese way of approach. Okay, let me give you my opinion on this exchange, okay? I understand Lady Defense's concern about the potential conflict between Taiwan and China in the future. However, I disagree with most of the things she said. And I think that the current Taiwan government, the Taiwan media, is heavily uh, Western leaning. And many of the information they provide to the public is very biased. So it led to this uh, extreme hate and anxiety towards China. And this is not going to change much uh, in the coming future. Regarding Mr. Wong, um, on three things, okay? First, I, I agree with him regarding China's economy. China has a lot of very talented people who runs uh, the economy, and I, I have faith in them to uh, make the necessary correction in order to improve China's uh, position and perhaps uh, get out of some of the current economic issues. Regarding freedom of speech and expression. Now, my experience is that 10 years ago, so I'm talking about before 2013, I think there is enough freedom of expression and freedom of speech in China for most people. And over the past decade, yes, there's a contraction and uh, a strengthening control of what you can say and what you can do in China. but. To me, okay, just to me, I think it has to do a lot with the increase in hostility coming from the West. And a lot of Chinese experts and definitely the ruling elite consider that as a destabilization campaign against China in order to have able some kind of color revolution in China. So I think many of the limitations, I, I cannot say that this is the correct string in terms of control. I have no idea what is considered good enough balance in between doing too much and doing too little. But I would say that the condition will change. I think in the future, when the global tension eases, Chinese government will also ease the control on speech and expression because I just do not think that keeping a high level pressure on censorship, on freedom of expression is beneficial and it's also costly and inconvenient. So in the long run, when there's less hostility in the world, I think China will open up in that direction. Last point regarding will China become a democracy in the future? Very extremely unlikely in the next few decades. But again, I, I do not see democracy as and then go, like I said, it's more like an instrument. And I think China will probably develop its own direction forward. And hopefully it is a peaceful one. And I do not agree with many mainstream media's narrative that being not a democracy make you more violent and hostile to neighboring country. I don't think that's the case. And I think and hope that China 
will find its own way and manage its relationship with its neighbor and other country around the world peacefully. So for open-minded people who make it this far into the video, I want to share a little bit personal story with you. And you can use this to look at also today's development of countries and society. Um, I came from a very poor family. My grandparents had a total of 12 kids, four from their second marriage, which my father is the firstborn, but they also have kids that are from the first marriage, four of each, so a total of 12. Six of them died, so there's six left. Very poor family, and when later on, all my uncles and aunties were born, family have to make a decision, okay? We do not have much wealth, money. Uh, we can use whatever saving we have to buy perhaps extra food for the family because we have a huge lack of protein and you know, nutrition issues. Um, he has a daughter that need to be married. That also costs money. He can also do some retouch up of the house, buy some new furniture, for example. And, you know, different family members have different opinions, okay? And, of course, we can put the issue to a vote. What to do with whatever saving we have. Or, my grandfather can be a dictator. And he can say that, well, I'm gonna use all my money to invest into one of you guys and send you to college. I cannot afford to send everyone to college. In fact, I cannot send everyone to school. Everyone can only get, you know, just the basic education, but I can afford to send one of you to a better education and give you a better chance and hope that, you know, when you become successful, you can change the fate of the family eventually. So my grandfather invested in my father, his first born son. And my father told me a very interesting story, okay? And I want my audience today to make that decision. So when my father graduated from college and he went to went on and got a very good job in the Chinese government. He was actually one of the youngest person to be promoted to a very senior position. Very well performing performed. And there was this very beautiful lady, uh, my father told me, that fall in love with him, okay? That lady came from a much better family, okay? And it got to a point that they were discussing. And there's this plan, according to the lady's father, that they will be moving to Canada and probably live off the rest of their life in, for example, Vancouver. And my father will be going with them after getting married, of course. And my father have to make the decision whether to leave or to stay. To leave means that, you know, he will be semi-abandoning many of the his family here in China who put a lot of hope and investment and time on him, uh, hoping that he will bring better fortune to the family. And if he stay, he have to you know, move away from his lover. And what will you do? You know, there, there's no contract sign, of course. He's an adult, so he can do whatever he want. And that going to Canada seems to be a right decision. But at the end, I'll tell you, he, he obviously stayed it. And he worked very hard to lift the entire family out of poverty. And... From my grandfather's perspective, you know, that is a very good decision. And it's good that at the beginning, you know, family didn't go through some kind of democratic process and just you know, split the money and do something that might end up not being too helpful decades you know, down the line. This is what I want people to think about. You know, um, Sometimes when Chinese think how we should develop in our country, we make a lot of sacrifices. And sometimes sacrifice, for example, in the early 1990s, uh, government decided to, to put most of the resources in coastal countries, such uh, coastal cities such as Shanghai and Shenzhen area. 
to have them become wealthy and later on hopefully the people will not just bring the wealth and you know, go elsewhere and leave the country in profit and they will actually help lift the rest of the country and make everyone become more prosperous and that is the decision that our leadership had to make back then and it sacrificed a lot of the well-being and resources of other part of the country and i, I won't say that if it is a democratic process if china was a democracy are we able to still get to where we are today because there are issue with democracy that you know, people are usually more short sighted and sometimes difficult but necessary decision is often not able to make in a society that's more democratic and as big as china and i want to give you a little bit plot twist at the end if i say that today's global economy and financial system is actually built in a way that favors or encourage someone like my father to actually become prosper and leave the country and not really look back if i tell you that's the world we are actually living in do you understand what i mean and to that end i will end today's video i will see you in the next video